So next up, we have Dr. Brian Beal. He's the University of Maine at Machias' Professor of Marine Ecology and Director of the Marine Science Field Station. And he's also the Director of Research at the Down East Institute. And he's going to be specifically presenting on the results of a pH and clam recruitment study he did in Cutler. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, so this study is funded through CNET, through the University of Maine, and it's looking at the effects of tidal height and predator exclusion along the sediment chemistry on the growth and survival of cultured softshell clams as well as wild recruits. Um, let's see. So again, CNET is the is the uh, uh, are the folks that have. How come I'm the only one that's having problems advancing the slides? Use the advancer. There we go. So here's the main soft shell clam landings from 1964 to 2017. And uh, because this study is done in Machias Bay, which is in Washington County, I wanted to take a look at the soft shell clam landings in Washington County as well. Hmm. See a pattern? Here's the state landings. Here's Washington County landings. Pretty, pretty, pretty much of a one-to-one. -one. Um, so this particular study was done in Machias Bay because of uh, some buoy studies that were also going on in Machias Bay. And there were two sites. One was in Machias Port at Larrabee Cove, and the other one was at Duck Brook Cove over in Cutler. And Amanda, you want to remember Duck Brook Cove at least in marine ecology, right? Um, so what we're interested in are the interactive effects of tide height, predator exclusion uh, on survival and growth of these clams, and how does the water column and sediment pH affect survival, growth, and recruitment. So this is uh, the, the, the setup at both Larrabee Cove and Duck Brook. We arrayed uh, our experiment, which I'll show you in just a moment, at both the high, the mid, and the low. And everything was exactly the same at the high, mid, and the low in terms of the design. <coughs> Uh, we put out plant pots like Kyle has shown you. Uh, some of them were protected with uh, netting. This was a very, very fine screen netting, like uh, window screening, but uh, a little bit more rigid called pet screening, but about the same aperture, which is extremely small, less than two millimeters. And then we put out recruitment boxes. I never named them veal boxes, by the way, so I'm just going to call them recruitment boxes. Um, and so this design was put out at, uh, at each one of these tidal heights. Uh, they were put out in June, and then they were torn down in uh, November, and then the low ones were, were torn down in either January or, or just a few weeks ago in February because of uh, problems getting to the, to, the, to the sites when the tide was low enough. So on the left you can see here is an open pot, and then on the right is the protected pot, again with window screening or pet screening. The average size of the clams that we planted uh, in these pots, uh, we planted 24 clams per pot. Uh, the average size was about 10 millimeters or slightly less than a half an inch in size. These seed were pr produced by uh, folks at DEI uh, in 2017 and then overwintered so that we were able to use them. And here's the survival results. <clears throat> you can see that, uh, first of all, uh, survival did not depend upon tidal as we had anticipated. Uh, survival was certainly dependent on the, uh, whether or not the pots were covered or not. So we had about less than 10% survival of unprotected clams, and we had about 63, 64% survival of the clams in, in the protected ones. And so you might say, well, geez, why, why was it only 62%? Well, some of the clams uh, just simply died due to, undance, due to some feature that left undamaged shells. Uh, but in these other two categories, the, the clams were either dead and chipped, and you can see that even in the protected pots, uh, that uh, clams were dead and chipped. And then we also had missing clams. And clams don't go missing from these pots just by chance alone. Something comes in and takes them, and so usually that's a crustacean. And in Down East Maine, if it's a crustacean on the mud flats, it's probably green crabs. We don't know it is 100%, uh, but uh, from various studies that we've done on these same flats, uh, we're pretty pretty much uh, assured that green crabs are the culprit. So 
This is, a, this is exactly the same sort of thing that Kyle has presented, and that is that if you're going to put out hatchery seed, you probably ought to protect it. Uh, is the protecting uh, mechanism 100% uh, deterrence to uh, green crabs and other predators? No, but it's better than nothing, as you can see here. Uh, in terms of growth, there's a growth penalty for clams in the uh, pots that are protected with this fine mesh screen, probably because of the, of the um, slower currents uh, that go on, as well as some of the fouling that occurs on these, uh, uh, on these nets. Uh, so clams will grow faster in the open pots, but they won't survive as well. You can't sell a dead clam, so there you go. So now I'm going to take a look at wild recruits. These pots are just sitting there, and they're simply uh, a passive tool to look at recruitment. And that's the way the boxes work as well. So the first slide here has to do with wild recruits in the plant pots. And as you can see, there's a, a significant difference in, between tidal heights in terms of the um, uh, recruits in, in the, uh, the, along the tidal height. There's a difference in recruits. And that difference is, uh, is, is stark at, at all tidal heights. But you can see the starkest difference is, is occurring at the low tidal height, where we got uh, many more soft shell clams. Uh, these are the numbers per square foot, not per pot. Uh, and as you can see, uh, regardless of whether or not uh, they were at the upper, the mid, or the low, there were, were very few clam recruits found in the open pots. So protecting them is a double bonus. You get your hatchery seed back, some of it, and you get wild recruits if they're there. Uh, there's about 16 per square foot uh, in the unprotected uh, containers. And their sizes varied. Uh, most of the sizes uh, were less than a half an inch in size. So that second uh, uh, arrow there is, is from about 12 millimeters uh, to the left. So anything to the left of those is less than half an inch. So these are not large clams going into the winter. And the same thing occurred uh, in the mid and the, and the low that were protected as well. So that was the, that was the uh, uh, material on the pots. Let's take a look at the, the recruitment boxes, again, in the same location. So at each site, we put out um, 30 uh, pots per tidal height. And we put out 15 boxes per tidal height. So there was a lot of, lot of running around. And of course, the boxes were, were then processed back in uh, Quote, our outdoor lab, John, we don't have a, an indoor lab uh, to, to do this. We, we, we've been doing this for over 30 years, and the uh, University of Maine Machias has found no interest in uh, helping poor slobs like uh, me and my students to get in out of the rain, cold, and ice. So we do it outside. Anyway, that was a little bit of a dig if you didn't get it. <laughs> So with the recruitment boxes, and I'm only going to give you the, I've only been giving you the data from one site, which is Cutler, because both of the, uh, the sites um, basically are giving the same pattern. So rather than giving both sites, we're just going to give the, the Cutler uh, information. So was there a difference in tidal height in terms of recruitment? Yes. And it kind of looks like the same sort of pattern that we saw in the plant pods where we got more clams recruiting into the low boxes than we did into the mid, and more, more clams recruiting into the mid boxes than we did from the upper ones. If we compare on a per square foot basis what we got from the plant pots versus what we got from the boxes, you can see that in both the upper and the mid, it's almost identical. And the low, the boxes actually recruited a little bit more clams than we did in the plant pots. So that's of interest. And the sizes of those clams in those boxes were very similar to the sizes of the clams in the plant pots. Most of them were less than half an inch in size. And interestingly, there wasn't much of a difference in uh, tidal height in terms of the size of those recruits. If we look at Machias port, and this is just for the boxes, um, we found no clams at all in the, in the 15 times 3, 45 boxes at the, uh, uh, at the upper. We only found a few clams. Uh, per square foot in the mid boxes, but in the low we found about 35 to 40 clams per <coughs> square foot in those, in those boxes. Um, so, I told you that we had done some measurements of sediment and seawater chemistry, and so let me share that data with you, which is not, um, not a lot of data, but um, we 
we were able to take pH measurements through time in, uh, in, in the mud that's adjacent to the pots and the boxes, and then at the end we were able to take pH samples uh, from some of the plant pots as well. So this is the Cutler Wild Recruits, and so this is pH information from them. So remember, um, there were uh, about 22, uh, 22 clams per uh, square foot from the open box, from the open boxes, and uh, over 175. Uh, these are the plant pots from from Cutler. Um, now this is pH of the sediment. Uh, and these are pH measurements that were taken uh, when we pulled these boxes. Uh, this is just a few weeks ago, but it's it's a it's a it's a feature that uh, hasn't changed much since last June when we first started, and that was is that the, the pH was actually um, lower in the open containers than it was the netted pots. So a pH of 7.02 versus a pH of 7.72 uh, is still a fairly fairly low pH, and because uh, we were able to take temperature measurements as well as alkalinity, we were able to, to calculate something called saturation state of aragonite, which is um, a way to measure whether or not clams should be accreting shell, that is to say growing shell, or whether or not the shell should be dissolving. And, ver and, and values of uh, this saturation state that are lower than one um, are, are places where the shell should be uh, dissolving. And you can see that um, our averages were well less than one. And so our clams are not dissolving, but the, the chemistry says they should be. So that's an interesting result, and we're going to be continuing to uh, drill down on that as we go. So in summary, predation rates on these clams was intense, as we found in many places around the state of Maine. Uh, more than 90% of the clams were lost or consumed from the units that were unprotected. And evidence of predation also occurred in protected pots, but uh, about 30% of those losses looked like they were due to crustaceans because they were either chipped, crushed, or, or missing. The wild recruit densities varied significantly across tidal heights with greater amounts occurring in the uh, low tide boxes and low tide pots at both sites. But as Sarah just showed you, that when a crab settles in just by random chance alone, you usually find zeros or, or one uh, adjacent to boxes that might have over 200 in them. Uh, pH levels in both the water and the sediments were less than 7.6, which is acidic or corrosive. Uh, and saturation states of aragonite, this is the primary constituent of the calcium carbonate that's in the shell of soft shell clams, was less than one, indicating that the shells should be dissolving, but yet we're finding plenty of, of uh, wild recruits in both the boxes and the, uh, uh, and the netted pots. So if we use fisheries-dependent data, okay, we have heard, heard about how we should be using fisheries-dependent data to estimate densities of clams on flats. So here's you know, something that, to me, should, suggests that uh, the clam fishery is a mere ghost of itself compared to where we were in the 1970s. But is that true? That is to say, is it simply because there's fewer clamors or is it because there's simply fewer clams? Well, um, if I can generate that, we'll get the one here. Um, we have years and years and tons of fisheries independent data. Everything that you have observed this morning is fisheries independent data. Studies that are done that suggest that there's recruits out there, but they're not making it for whatever reason. And it looks to me as though right now, it's not because of chemistry, it's because of biology. So climate change is having an impact, a profound impact on Maine soft shell clam fishery. Industry, management, the legislature, whomever can choose to ignore this fact, um, along with science-based recommendations, for changes that seek to increase clam harvests along the coast. We can do nothing, and ignoring that uh, the current state of the fishery is uh, in dire shape is, is not going to solve the problem. What I think is needed is action and an activity to bring about sweeping changes in how clam populations are managed in this state. We don't need more inaction, and we don't need more idleness. Thank you.